have with us today uh, Dr. Walter Gilliam um, from the Yale uh, Center of all those words that are up there. <laughs> Center of Awesomeness, we'll go with that. I was going to be speaking with us about preschool expulsion and, suspel and suspension and some children, uh, childhood developmental uh, issues. So um, I won't uh, speak any longer so that we can hear the content, but I just want to say thank you all for participating in the caucus, coming to grab lunch, and um, we uh, are going to be having another uh, meeting. Kim, when's the next uh, caucus meeting? Uh, the 11th. The April 11th. April 11th. In the legislative council room. After session, so mark your calendars now, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, Dr. Gillian. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back up here. I was here not too long ago in September. I had a chance to meet several people and <laughs> talk to the education committee from baggage claim in Logan yesterday. <laughs> so most of you who were kind of hear me over the baggage claim noise, I, I appreciate that too. Um, so here, Catherine's gonna be, Catherine's gonna be uh, progressing the slides. I was asked to come here and talk to you about, uh, and there's Rita, who invited me. Thank you, Rita. Um, I was asked to come and talk to you about children being expelled from preschool programs and what it is that we know about this. And, and all of that in the service of the fact that, that Maine is interested in, in, in potentially passing legislation on an issue like this uh, regarding children being expelled and not expelling children and also uh, the potential for investing in programs like early childhood health consultation that we know is probably the most promising. Bill, you are being too modest. There is a great piece of legislation coming out of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a great, great piece of legislation. <laughs> <laughs> You're all going to want to support. So yes, and, green is not and, I, and, I, and, I, and I know who, 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 who would probably be, be actually promoting that piece of legislation. I'm the sponsor of that. Out of Dr. Gilliam's excellent research. Thank you so much. So if I slip into modesty, please, please bolster the back up. <laughs> Thank you. So if you can progress the slide to the, to the next slide. So this is a topic that's gotten a lot of attention lately. Part of that attention really uh, came from when the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, and uh, Marnie Duncan, the Secretary of Ed at the time, signed a piece of, 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 of joint policy position statement on the issue of children being expelled from preschool programs. And it's, it's common from time to time to get a department in the federal government to have a position statement on a topic, but to have two departments simultaneously issuing a, a joint position statement against one issue is, 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 is pretty rare. And the issue that they were uh, releasing this one about was about children being expelled from preschool programs. And there was a large number of children being expelled from these programs, and when I'm talking about preschool, I'm talking about children three, four, or in many cases younger than three or four years old. Uh, in childcare programs, in public school-based pre-K programs, in state-funded Head Start programs, and on and on, who are losing a placement because the child has some kind of intelligent behavior, and the teacher doesn't know what to do about this, and so they, they tell the child to go away. And, and to never come back. Now it's called a lot of different things in a lot of different places, and I'm used to hearing it called things other than preschool expulsion. I'm used to hearing some people referring to it as as not yet ready for school readiness. Right. <laughs> uh, I've heard it referred to as as uh, we're not the right place. I've heard it referred to as, and this is my favorite, I've heard it referred to as giving the child the gift of time. <laughs> just lots of different ways to make it sound a little bit better than what it is. And what it is basically is parents need the child care in order to be able to go to work. And so the child is in some kind of early care and education setting that we hope is also going to be beneficial to that child. Because why waste that child's time and why waste our taxpayer dollars to provide child care and not also take advantage of the opportunity to be able to help this child succeed. But as a result of the fact that this program is not actually adequately resourced to be able to understand how to deal with some children with challenging behaviors, these children leave and they're told that they can't be there anymore. Now what, what becomes challenging about this too is that there's a lot of different ways to, to think about it. Now you'll have some folks that will say things like, well, aren't you concerned about the other children in the classroom? And what if you have a child with a behavior problem, and aren't you concerned about all those other kids who have to suffer through that child's behavior problem? Now the way for you 
to address that, if you hear that from somebody, is you say to them, well, I am concerned. Why aren't you, though, concerned about all the other children this child will go to when they get kicked out of this classroom in the other classrooms this child will emerge in? At about six months old, children get a sense of object permanence. Object permanence means if I, if I take an object and I hide it, then the baby will remember that it's there and know that it's there and then look for it and find it. But somewhere between about six months old and becoming a, 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 an administrator in a, in a school, we lose our sense of object permanence. <laughs> <laughs> and we think that if we don't see the baby, the baby doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> When in fact the baby does exist, <laughs> the baby just goes to another child care program or another preschool program and keeps re-emerging in all these places. And so now, instead of dealing with the challenge, when the child is younger and smaller and the challenges are smaller, we allow the challenges to become greater and greater over time, the child to become larger and larger over time, until we get to the point of where they're very, very, very difficult to deal with. Uh, you may also hear people say, well, of course, uh, the talking heads will say, do nothing and let these children run amok. The thing to respond to them when they say that is, no, expulsion is doing nothing. There is something that we can do, and what we can do is we can provide supports to these teachers in the classroom in order to be able to help these teachers be more effective. Because I can tell you this, I, I used to be a public school teacher. <coughs> it never feels good to feel like you feel like it. There is no teacher who wants to expel children from preschool classrooms. They do it because they don't know what else to do. But what we can be doing is we can make sure that we provide them the supports they need in order to be successful in those classrooms. We pay our preschool teachers about half of what we pay a kindergarten teacher. And we give them nowhere near the support that they need. We need to make a decision. We either pay them like the professionals they are, or at the very least give them the supports that they need. But to do neither, to do neither is a disservice to them, and ultimately that means a disservice to our children. So, Lots of attention to the federal government, uh, if you can progress to the next slide, and the state government in Connecticut. In August 5th of 2015, our Governor Malloy signed into legislation, uh, the first state that has actually um, um, had legislation to uh, outlaw the practice of expelling children from preschool programs um, and suspending them. Uh, we passed this in, um, in Sorry, I went I'm sorry, that's okay. We passed this back then, and it was about preschool classrooms, but we actually ended up expanding the legislation to preschool through grade two. And so preschool through grade two, no suspensions, no expulsions. And the idea behind it is because we knew from the research that preschool expulsion and suspension doesn't help them with As a matter of fact, the very best predictor of being suspended or expelled from a preschool program is what? having been expelled or suspended before. And so if it, so if it, the idea is to help prevent children from misbehaving, it's a bad idea that ain't working very well. So we wanted to do something else. Yes, sir? Does Connecticut have universal pre-K? Universal, no. What we have is a targeted program, and it's, it's super targeted. It's, it's more targeted in most states. So we have a state-funded pre-K program where to be eligible for it, you have to be poor in a poor town because the money flows from the, from the capital to certain towns that have uh, a certain poverty level, and then if you're poor or low income in that town, you'll be eligible. But there's certain other states that are looking at the legislation like this too that do have people. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's, it's, this isn't the right time for this question, but if you have, like, our age, that someone can be <coughs> four, four but the age cutoff for going into kindergarten is October. Yeah. But if it was maybe August, then the kids would be a little bit older. And then you were talking about the, uh, expulsion. And a couple of the teachers I've talked to that are doing kindergartens, are, they don't want to expel anybody. They don't, maybe they don't even have that option. They just don't use it. They want to make everything work, but they get these kids that are so young that is disruptive to a more age-appropriate kindergarten. Yes. You got an opinion on that, you're gonna wait till later, that's great, but I wanted to I can, information I can, about that. Yeah, I can, and I can, and I can try to answer a little bit on it. It's a, it's a complex study, and the reason why, there's nobody who's actually done a study where they 
literally purposefully randomize kids to either go early to kindergarten or not go early. So all we have is correlational data based on where the state happens to be setting the cutoffs. And different states have different cutoffs, but in no way is that actually related to actually anything other than just historically where they set it. And so we can we can look at some correlational relationships to be able to make some of the cases. I mean, part part of the issue is that if you if you change the the age eligibility for kindergarten, that has impacts in many states. What kids are not going to be able to go to kindergarten because if you now change the eligibility and the children have to be uh, four, five years old by a certain age, that means that some of the kids this year, as opposed to last year, aren't going to be eligible to go to kindergarten. So they're going to have to go to preschool. And that means they can go to preschool if their parents can afford it and if they can find it in the state. So when, when you change the policy, it may feel like you're having beneficial impacts for the kindergarten and the kindergarten teachers. But what you're also doing is you may be making it such that for the poorer children or the children who live in more rural areas where there might be less access to preschool programs, these children now spend another year going nowhere. You know, and so it becomes one of those things where, I mean, it's, it's, it's like this in whatever the policy is. We have to figure out what is the policy, what is the good that we want to do with policy? What is the policy that we're considering? What is the likelihood that it's going to do good? And what are all the unintended side effects of that that we don't really intend to happen, but can happen anyway? And what are the ill that can come from that? And in the end, which one weighs more? And some of the times, some of the times you, you come up with policies that, that the, the, the profile of good to ill is actually in our favor. And some of the times we come up with policies where the ill effects might actually be just about as bad as what we already have. You know, and this is one of those where it's just a tricky topic. Well, what you're talking about, probably one policy was set before the other. And that what I'm hearing from yes. my kindergarten teachers is that they now have to have everyone at the end of that year has to be able to write or read. And a four-year-old coming in as a four-year-old, that might not be appropriate. You know, like I read late, but I love to read. I read tons. And that's there's a range of learning to read. But now we've said, you will do this, this grade, and not even just this grade, but this kindergarten. Uh, is that part of the formula that says we might be doing more harm by sending four-year-olds for a couple months well, into that's, school? Well, that's what becomes tricky. So, so okay. in a scenario like that, what's wrong? The four-year-old or the requirement that all these four-year-olds have to be reading by the time they enter kindergarten. I know, right? You know, that's, that's, that's the tricky. Because anytime I talk to a kindergarten teacher and I ask them, what is it you want to accomplish in kindergarten? They think their job is to help them learn how to read. What they really want is children who have the social skills necessary to be able to take full advantage of kindergarten. Yep. Not necessarily to come to kindergarten with all the skills that kindergarten was designed to teach in the first place. You know, but some of the times, we get so caught up in education in terms of some of the things that we feel like we can measure, that we feel like that's the most important thing. The most important thing really for us to be teaching our children in the preschool program is how do you get along in a school like seven? Yeah. How do you feel okay being away from mom and dad? How do you feel okay learning from and working with an adult that you haven't met before? How do you feel about sharing your resources and sharing adult attention with a bunch of other children when you may not have ever experienced being around a bunch of other children before. And it's easy to overlook that and think those are little tiny minor things, but when you're three or four, those are big, huge things. And if you can master those then, it makes you so much more available for the learning that's gonna happen in kindergarten. Yes, How available is CDS to a preschool and kindergarten? Um, I'm looking at just an example of a friend who had her child in daycare uh, and has a form of Asperger's. And the difficulty this child had, and almost got expelled, because he had problems with touch. And he had problems with, you know, over stimulation. And it was his frustration that created the behavior. And uh, once the, he was really evaluated and, and uh, taken care of and found out what they could do to work with that, he, stayed, he was able to stay in the program. Uh, so how available in terms of even daycare is CDS for these people who are taking care of this? Okay, so acronyms vary by state. So when you say right. CDS. Child Development Services. 
Child Development Services, yes. which Early is Early Intervention Programs. Yeah. Preschool yeah. Special Ed. Preschool Special Ed, got it, okay. Yeah. Federally, we would call that Part B or Part C. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling that CDS. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's that, there's, a, there's a lot of children who, who may come into our early care and education programs with some concerns that are really difficult for us to wrap our heads around. And we need a lot of support for those teachers to be able to effectively work with those children. And there's some children who may come into our programs who have some significant concerns, but they're not difficult concerns to deal with if only there were the right person made available to that teacher to be able to give that teacher the skills that they need to be able to succeed. And there's an awful lot of these children. An awful lot of children for which a little tiny bit of help would go a huge way, especially if we came in at just the right moment. If we come in at just the right moment, we can sometimes have just massive impacts. I'll tell you about a you know, I was planning on saying this later, but, but this is a this is a this is an engaging group. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into it right now. So I used to provide, I used to be a public school teacher before I got a change in career and ended up as a as a professor at Yale uh, in the child psychiatry and child psychology department. But but before that I was a school teacher and for a while an early childhood mental health consultant. So I was doing this kind of work in preschool classrooms. And there's been times that I've gone into preschool classrooms where the, the, the teacher, in this case a Head Start teacher for this story that I'm thinking of, uh, said that the biggest concern that she had was that the kids ran right down the middle of the classroom like it was a drag strip. And they would bump into each other and some child would get hurt and then all hell would break loose. You know? and, and this was the description that she was giving me and she wanted to know well, what can we do to be able to help don't help reduce that problem. Now, of course, when you're brought in as a consultant, the, the, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta listen very intently, and then the second thing you do is don't give the answer too fast. Because if you do, if you do, that's assaulting, you know, so you gotta struggle a little bit, you know? So, and so we struggled together, and then I asked her, I said, well, okay, well, so why is it that you have a drag strip in the middle of your classroom? And so we, we prefer, how many people have been in a preschool classroom? Okay, so you know that in preschool classrooms, typically, we have bookshelves that are about this tall, right? Why is that? Because we ran out of material? No. The reason why is because we are taking advantage of a height differential that adults have over preschoolers. We can have furniture this big, and we can create smaller demarcated areas for children to interact in, and at the same time, the adults can supervise what's going on. And it tends to be movable. So if you move the furniture around, you can make smaller areas out of this big, huge room. Once you make the smaller areas out of this big, huge room, one, you don't have children crashing into each other, but two, now that there's smaller areas, what happens? The children start playing together and working together in smaller groups. What happens when they start working together in smaller groups? They, there's a greater likelihood of cooperative play and they talk more. And the number one source of origin or words that a preschooler hears in a preschool classroom is not the teacher, it is the other children. And once you start moving the furniture around and you change things this way, some of the times you can impact the behaviors and then some of the times you can have massive impacts on other things like language acquisition, simply because you move the furniture around. Now I'll tell you about another kid real quick, which was a child who was three years old, was in a preschool program and I was brought in because the teacher, this, this lovely maternal, uh, grandmother the black woman would sit in her chair and she would read to the children and, and the children loved it they would all stand and sit around her and she had this one child who was new three years old would crawl up into her lap during story time she was reading the book he was crawling up in her lap and then he would look up sometimes and just look at her and then just kind of fall asleep and sometimes he would look up at her and punch her in the face <laughs> hard really hard and she had no idea which one was coming <laughs> so she would sit there and he would crawl up in her lap and she would read her book <laughs> she had no idea so I was asked to come in now I met, I met with, with with mom and dad and of course this was really concerning to them they had no idea what how to understand this why is this child doing this and when you don't understand what's causing a problem it's sometimes really easy to become very frustrated with the problem and you don't know where it's coming from I met with the parents and found out that that dad had only known this child for about six months. Uh, six months ago, the child's mother came to dad with a child that he had never seen before. 
and said that, that she needed his help. It was an emergency. She had to go run an errand and she'll be right back. Oh, no. And she never came back. And this child was raised by a man and his new wife who was pregnant. Now, when you understand that part of the story, it's easy to understand that what we have here was a three-year-old child who climbed up into this woman's lap. This woman who was very motherly, she just, just the way she was, you know? And he climbed up in her, her lap needing two different things. You know, sometimes he just needed to feel like he was near mom. And sometimes he just wanted to punch the hell out of mom. When you have both of those, you know what? And, and the times in our life when it's difficult for us as adults, and certainly difficult for, for babies, is not when we have strong emotions, it's when we have strong competing opposite emotions. Those are the real challenging times. And for this baby, when you know the story, the rest of it all makes sense. You know, sometimes it's challenging like this. Sometimes it's just moving furniture, you know. But anyway, I'll go back to, to work because that is going to come the rest of this story. Yes, sir. Well, what I want to say is the point is graphically that preschool teachers need to be highly trained. And the other is, um, the program in Connecticut, is that a combination of heads, federal head start funds and state head start funds? Our state, our state funded pre-K program? Yeah. So we have in, Connecticut is like Maine. We have, well, in some ways. <laughs> Not in other ways, I guess. We have a state-funded pre-K program where we have some federal dollars that come through CCDBG, um, federal child care, and then we use those dollars, and then we add to the state funds, and then we create a unique state-funded pre-K program for children through the four years old. Head Start. And then we also have a state-funded Head Start program. And Maine is like that, too. So you also have a kind of Head Start program, and you also have unique pre-K dollars. And also it's a state and federal Head Start program. We, we have both of those different systems. They operate with different systems. Okay. Yeah. So and Maine is actually, some of our some communities have a combination where a local Head Start provider and a school, school combined. Yes. Yes. And, and, and nationally, 17% of all Head Start communities are in public school. You know, so in those cases too, they they they, they just combine simply because that's the dream. You're welcome. So progressing along, um, we did a study back in 2002, released the findings in 2005. Next click. Uh, asked the teachers in the past 12 months, have you ever required a child to terminate participation because of, in your program because of challenging behavior? Don't include children who are transitioned directly from your preschool program to a potentially more appropriate settings, such as uh, special ed preschool or something else like that. And so when we did this with state-funded pre-K programs, now this is not child care on the whole, this is pre-K programs that are supported by the, by the state. So these are some of the better resource preschool programs, often working in the public school. About two-thirds of these were actually pre-K programs in a public school. 10% of teachers said yes, that has happened in the past four months. Next click. Uh, usually it was only one child that it did, sometimes two, next clip, sometimes three, sometimes four children in the past 12 months. We piloted this before we went national in child care programs in Massachusetts. And when we piloted it in Massachusetts, we had one teacher of a child care program with three and four year olds uh, together who reported expelling six children of the class of 16 in the course of 12 months. It's almost half the class. You know, and, and when you see rates like that, it's a lot of kids. When you see rates like that, it's enough to make you think that it may not be just the child's behavior. But there might be other factors that are actually in play here that could explain an epidemic of children being expelled from a, from a program. Next click. We did the math. We knew how many children were being so we're enrolled in the program, so we could divide by the number of expulsions. This is the number of time of expulsions per thousand children enrolled nationwide in state funded pre-K programs. So is that a lot? Is that a little? Or is that just like baby bear and just right? I mean, is that the number that you would expect? So we didn't have anything to compare it to, so we decided we would compare it to K through 12 expulsion rates. And so the K through 12 <coughs> expulsion rate, next click, is this, which allowed us to be able to run with the headline of children are being expelled from state funded pre-K programs for three and four years old at a rate more than three times that of rates K through 12 combined. Is that K-12 yes. in public schooling? K-12 public schools. Public and private. Yes, K-12 public schools. It was from data collected from the Office of Civil Rights and Mr. Department of Education. 
supervising public uh, surveying public school superintendents. Yes, sir. Is that data broken down by uh, grade ranges? Like no, nope. okay. unfortunately, they never did. They broke it down based on race, based on ethnicity, based on gender, based on disability. Type of the data. I wish they had. It would be great to be able to show. But my guess is, based on other research that we have available, that the expulsion rates tend to spike up around middle school, going into middle school, and then around 10th grade, they tend to taper back off because we push the kids out and we don't expel them anymore. Um, and so my guess is what you really would see is, is pre-K expulsion rates way up here, kindergarten down here, and then middle school, and then high school. That's right, that's based on my experience. Yeah. And, the pre, and, the, and in the preschool programs, the rates are crazy high. Crazy high. Next slide. Um, we can color code it by map. Uh, this is a color coded map that we put out in 2005. Helped us get lots of the attention. The states in red are the states that have the highest expulsion rate. Wow. Uh, and you, you, yeah. Sorry, I'm moving. That's okay. And so there, there, there you are. Uh, Maine was number two wow. in the nation in terms of rate of expelling children from preschool programs. Uh, you want to know? You want to? You want to know who's beating you? Sure. Yeah, sure. Who? Alabama. 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 That's a that's a good guess because it is in red. Um, <laughs> one I should also say the ones that, are, that have no coloration they have the lowest expulsion rate. Their expulsion rate is zero because they don't have a state funded pre K program for which to expel. <laughs> <laughs> so their rates are zero. So that's the best solution. <laughs> yes, I guess. Um, New Mexico. Wow. New Mexico has the highest rate, but their program was itty bitty teeny mini program. It's an exceedingly small pre-K program, and so I, it's hard to know whether it's maybe an anomaly. Uh, but other than that, this was the highest. Uh, Connecticut was seventh highest. Yes, sir. So, do you have any idea why we're treating our preschoolers so poorly? Um, you know, I, I, I looked into the I, I looked into this as much as I can, and there's some things that are easy to research, and there's some things that are complicated to research. I, I think that the, the primary reason for this is that we expel children from preschool programs because we can. And when you're talking about children who are kindergarten and higher, these are children who are who are of compulsory school attendance age. They have to be in school. They have to be in school. They have to be at home school or something, and so. If the child is expelled a compulsory school attendance age, it creates a legal problem for the parents because their child's not in school. But when you're talking about preschoolers, these children are voluntarily attending and voluntarily offered program. They don't legally have to be there. And so when you're talking about compulsory school attendance age, it's a legal issue, so the process of expulsion is a legalized process. But when you're talking about preschoolers, it's not legalized, the process is the teacher sits down with the parent and says, I just don't think this is working out. That's the whole process. So I, I understand that, but we still have a much higher rate than like the exclusive. Oh, you mean why is it so high in Maine? Yeah, why are I was hoping you would tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work with invertebrates. Invertebrates? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why would I have to? Because public schools are not, public school administrators are not trained for early childhood education. Public school teachers are not trained for early childhood education. So they don't know, as in your examples, how to handle those kind of situations. So they, they you know, I think that's a big part of it. You have a classroom where no person was a certified head start teacher, certified in early childhood education, or when it's public school teacher. <clears throat> you have training or some of the Head Start program blended with the public school program. There's technical assistance available to help you help you teach your kids who are not mature enough, usually is what it is. Um, yeah, well you could say mature enough, but you could also say as mature as we would like them to be based on how we're conceptualized in a program we're put in dimension. You know, and, and so, sure enough for the program it may not be age appropriate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if you have you, it's one thing to put a child into a preschool classroom where all the furniture is preschool sized, and it would be silly looking to put a child in a preschool classroom where all the furniture is adult sized. But if you forget about furnishing for a second and you just focus on the way in which we interact and we treat each other, some of the times we treat our young children with adult sized interactions. 
because we don't simply know how to work with young children. It's a, it's a, it's a funny thing. If we rely on teachers who haven't been adequately trained in young children, they, they end up working with three-year-olds the best way they can remember what it was like themselves to be in third grade. Because they don't remember being in a preschool classroom because many of them never were in a preschool classroom. And so if that's the way you're interacting with young children, you're going to run into lots of challenges and problems. And so we think the best way to deal with them is to provide supports. Next slide, please. Uh, lots of other research on it. Uh, rates are much higher in child care programs. Illinois is an interesting one. 42% of centers reported expelling at least one child in the past 12 months. What's interesting about this is in Illinois, the study was only infant toddler centers. That was the only one we're looking at, which is centers serving children birth up to three years old. So even in, even for babies, 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 the rates of expulsion are really quite, quite, quite high. What's the number one reason for expelling a baby from a preschool program? Right. Fighting, yeah, fighting. See, doesn't this doesn't surprise me. You all knew all this. Next slide, please. So if you if you actually make a graph out of it, there's K through 12, there's pre-K, there's child care in terms of the likelihood of a child being expelled. Next slide, please. Um, lots of factors predict the future child ratios. The more children per adult, the more likely a child is to be expelled. Does that surprise anybody? No. Uh, the longer the program is open per day, the more likely a child is to be expelled. Does that surprise anybody? Is this, yes, is this just in pre-K? This is just in pre-K. It's just in pre-K. Teacher job stress, the more stress that the teacher reports, in terms of job stress that the teacher has, the more likely a child is to be expelled. Teachers who screen positive for depression expel at twice the rate of teachers who screen negative for depression, their own depression. Does that surprise anybody? Mo the amount of access to somebody who can in the classroom and work with the teacher when a child is having a challenging behavior. The more access, the less the likelihood of the child being exposed. That's surprising to anybody. But there's something in common about every one of these variables. These are the main predictors that predict the likelihood of a child being expelled from a preschool program. What do all of these variables have in common? Cause. Yeah, nothing to do with kids' behaviors. It's got to do with cause. Yeah, every one of them. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> so I mean, this is really not about children. This is about you know what it is that we're providing for them, and are we providing them the right kind of supports in order for them to be able to succeed, and for their teachers to be able to succeed in that environment. Uh, next slide. So when you put it together, this is the conclusion that I have: preschool exposure is not a child behavior. It's, it's really an adult decision that may be based in part of the behavior of the child, but it's also based on availability of resources that a teacher can pull together and whether the program is able to meet the needs of the child and meet the needs of the family and work effectively with the parents. And that's like the next slide, please. Uh, so we, we at Yale, we love our preschool teachers. Uh, here's this cartoon card is slightly larger than normal, but that's because you're a preschool teacher. We want to be careful when we talk about these things not to vilify our teachers who are doing the absolute best that they can in the extremely challenging circumstances that we often place them in. Where we pay them very, very, very little to take care of children in poverty, and in order to help them empathize with that, we pay them poverty wages. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's, basically, that's basically the position that we oftentimes put our teachers in. And then on top of it, don't give them the supports they need in order to succeed, even the supports that would normally be available if that teacher were in a public school. They might have access at least to a guidance counselor, school social worker, nurse. But if you're a preschool teacher, in many cases, you are out there on your own, uh, doing the very best that you can. And in some cases, the very best that they can is letting children go. They don't know what else to do. They don't have the supports they need. Next slide, please. Uh, remember, I said teacher job stress. Uh, that's an issue of job stress right there. There's the there's the rates. Next slide. I'm going to let you. Oh, here's a cartoon. Today we're going to explore and paint how we feel when we're picked up late from preschool. <laughs> uh, that's job stress. That's job. You want to hear what job stress might sound like? Go to the next slide. And then if you'll hit this, I'll start this video. At home, the four-year-old Megan is like any little girl her age. She likes to play and loves her kitten Jiminy. It's what was happening at school at Memorial Elementary that has had her parents puzzled. She's been having some behavioral problems in class, um, but the behavior problems that we're getting described are not things that she does here at home. So after months of wondering why, Diana and Oscar Mijadas spent 50 bucks on a digital recorder, put it in Megan's backpack, turned it on, and sent it to school. And this is just a sampling of what they heard. Nobody, I'm simple. You're just a bad kid. I'm a shark and I just 
I couldn't believe it. The couple was stunned. This was a veteran teacher talking to four and five year olds and sometimes singling them out. They took the recording to the principal, who in a statement to us called the comments, quote, reprehensible and totally unacceptable. He writes he immediately removed the teacher from the classroom and reassigned her as the investigation continues. But Megan's parents say the district has an obligation to keep this from continuing. I really don't feel that she should be teaching anymore. <laughs> Yeah. So and that's what that's what Josh stress might sound like. You know, in this again, this is a kindergarten classroom. Does this happen in Texas? Yes. Does this happen in Maine? Yeah. Does, does this happen in Connecticut? Does this happen, you know, name your state? Yeah, this happens. You know, and, and when teachers don't have the amount of support that they need, in some cases they start to resort to very stressful reactions. We all can become stressful at whatever job that we're doing. And, and when we're stressed out, so many times it negatively impacts the work that we're doing, and in this case, the work that these teachers are doing is, is, is working with young children. And so it's gonna, it's gonna impact into the next slide. Uh, parent provider connections. Ah, I can tell you this, I've never seen a child expelled from a preschool program if the parent and the teacher knew and liked each other. Hmm. Anytime that I've ever seen the parent and the teacher knew and liked each other, that child does not get expelled. So then the question becomes, you know, how do we make sure that we are able to harness that protective power of parents and teachers actually having a strong connection? Here is a child with mom, and right here, and then there's a stranger, and the stranger wants to hold the child. Here's mom, stranger wants to hold the child, and the child is looking at mom and wanting to go back to this. Uh, you've seen this before, right? Next <coughs> slide. It's cold, right? Uh, you see this before? <laughs> Next slide. Have you seen that before? <laughs> Next slide. Um, you know, when when you think about when you think about things like 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 stranger anxiety, how many how many, have you, how many people have been around toddlers? Like eighteen months, most many people. So when you have a young child, and the young child, a toddler is with mom or dad or some other familiar person and they see a stranger let's say you could be the you could be the stranger the child is 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 here and the strength the child sees the stranger and the child looks at the stranger and realizes oh this is somebody i don't know what does the child do at that point the child will typically turn around and look right at the parent like intent right at the parent to see what your reaction is to see what the, how the, how is the parent looking at you and that child doesn't know whether you are safe or unsafe or scary or harmful but i'm going to take my and babies are so good at it and the reason why is if they weren't good at it they would not survive you know that's how babies learn what's safe and what's scary what i can do what I shouldn't do by focusing intently on the adults that they care about and reading those emotional states really fast and then absorbing those emotional states into themselves. Well, when a baby is laying in a crib and the baby starts crying, ah, and then the parent comes and picks up the baby, does the parent pick up the baby and then just hold the baby? No, the parent typically moves at the same rate that the baby is moving at. And then the baby, the parent slowly calms down, and then over time the baby calms down too with the parent because the baby starts mirroring the emotional state of the parent. The parent picks the baby up and matches that baby in terms of just how active that baby is. And then after a while the baby latches into and synchronizes with the parent, and then the baby calms down along with the parent. And we don't have to typically teach parents how to do this. We just kind of know that that's what you do. When you have a young child who's looking at the stranger and then looks at the parent to be able to gauge, that's a clue to us that when we're talking about young children going into preschool classrooms, it is exceedingly important that the parent and the teacher have a strong connection because that child is going to gauge the safety of that teacher from the connection that their parent has to that child. I was, I've been asked oftentimes by parents, what is the best way to help my child with the first day of kindergarten? And usually when, and it's something like, you know, I have to put my child on a bus for the first time. My child's starting kindergarten, but like, what's the best way to help my child deal with that? And usually when parents tell me that, what I really hear is, 
what is the best way for me to deal with how scary this is for me to put my child on a bus to send my child to kindergarten? And we may think that you know preschool is young. We may think kindergarten young. First grade. Whenever you first put your child on a bus, that's the definition of young. <laughs> you know, because that child's going to feel really young when you're letting that child go away from you to a school. And usually, my best answer to that is something along the lines of. Now, make sure that you feel comfortable with that person you're putting that. Have you met the bus driver yet? Do you know the bus driver? Do you feel comfortable with the bus driver? But if you don't feel comfortable, your child's not going to feel comfortable. And you're not going to go to hide it. You know? If we could have opportunities for our parents and our preschool teachers to interact in more solid ways, that would probably go a long distance in terms of actually reducing the likelihood of the child being expelled because the likelihood of expelling a child when you have a strong connection to the parent is pretty small and if the child has a strong connection to the parent and the parent has a strong connection to the teacher that the parent's going to lend that connection to the child and then the child's going to be better connected to the teacher next slide uh, oh i'm sorry so remember this one uh one more click the more access to a behavioral consultant or something from the classroom the less likely the child is to be expelled next slide um, so in Connecticut, we created a statewide system of early childhood mental health consultation. And that system cost us to cover the entire state uh, a little over $2 million. It covers the entire state. Um, it's available to all programs, public or private, that serve children birth up to five years old. So if you're a public school-based pre-K program, yes. If you're a Head Start program, yes. If you're a mom and pop child care program, or a for-profit child care program, yes. If you're an infant toddler program, yes. If you're offering child care services in your home as a, as a, as a home-based child care program, as an independent business, yes, it covers you too. And so any program, public or private, that requests somebody who can come into the program and assist with a child who has a challenging behavior is able to get this free of charge to the program. All paid for by the state of Connecticut uh, through our state uh, Department of Children and Families, which is our Child Protection Agency. So our state Child Protection Agency sets aside about $2.7 million a year just specifically for this program. Um, it's classroom-based. <clears throat> when I talk about these kind of programs, the consultant comes in and coaches and works with the teachers. Uh, what happens is not the consultant coming in, and these are all master's level mental health providers who have specialized training in how to work with young children and how to work with teachers, how you work through a teacher. They don't come into the classroom and pull the child out and do some mental health magic in the hallway. That is not what they do. What instead, what they do is they work with the child by working through the teacher and they coach the teacher on different ways that the teacher can be interacting with these children because we will never have enough mental health providers to treat all of our children one child at a time. Uh, we'll never be able to get ahead of it that way. The only way to be able to do this is to be able to provide some kind of support to the child in a way that leaves a residual there with the teacher. And so how can we work with the teacher in order to not only help that teacher with this one child, but help that teacher with all the subsequent children that might come into this child's classroom. It's interesting that we're in this room right here. This is where the uh, juvenile justice, the, the justice, the juvenile justice committee is. How many people have heard about the Perry Preschool Study and all that? Every dollar that's spent on early care and education yields seven dollars and fourteen cents. How many? And that's by the time the children are twenty-seven years old. How many people know that of that seven dollars and fourteen cents, six of those dollars is juvenile justice right. and criminal justice? Welcome. Most of it has to do with reducing challenging behaviors later on. Uh, in, in, in life. And when you think about, you know, sort of like what is the impact of all of this work that we do, the impact of this work that we're doing is really to try to make sure that our children are less likely to be engaged in criminal activity later on, less, more likely to be graduating from high school, more likely to be able to uh, have a painful employment and paying into the taxes instead of drawing money out of the taxes. Uh, these mental health consultants work with the teachers in order to make sure that these children are able to stay in the preschool program because one child that I can tell you that, that never benefits from preschool is the child who gets kicked out. That child doesn't benefit from it. But we also know from lots of science that the children you would want to kick out from a preschool program, those are the children that give you the return on the investment. It's the children who have the most to gain 
that tend to gain the most from preschool programs. And when you kick them out, all that happens is they just sit around and they grow bigger and then they go to kindergarten. <laughs> And then you have to do it there. Yes, sir. Doctor, it says there's a home based component. Can I assume yeah. then that there's some kind of parent management training that's a yeah. component yeah. of this? Yeah, so let me tell you quickly basically what happens. Uh, go to the next slide. Please, it's only three months long. Uh, it, again, it's not this, it's not talking to babies on the couch, it's working directly with teachers. Next slide. Uh, there's a study, and I can get you in contact with this with, 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 with this paper um, that we recently published on this program in Connecticut, describing the program and also describing what the effects of the program is. To briefly state that what, what it is, is it's a three month long intervention with these mental health consultants. We take advantage of people who are already in child guidance clinic in the state. Nobody knew was hired to do this work in Connecticut. These are already extant mental health providers that we then provide extra training to and then we mobilize them to preschool classrooms when the teacher needs them. What we typically do in mental health services is we have mental health providers who are in clinics and then we wait for things to deteriorate so bad that the child needs to go to the mental health clinic. What if we didn't think of it this way? And what if we instead mobilize the same exact resources and said, instead what we want is we want these support people to be mobilized into preschool classrooms before we absolutely what if we did it that way? And what if we took advantage of the fact that we could have partnerships between preschool teachers who are dying for support and mental health providers who are waiting for children to deteriorate? And what if instead we provided better, better, better collaborative opportunities to do that? That's basically what this model is about here. So the mental health consultant goes and then they meet with the teacher in the classroom, they watch what's happening, and then they immediately set up an appointment with the parent. Why immediately? Because if you wait too long, the consultant's gonna be seen as being too aligned with the school. And usually, by the time a mental health consultant is requested, things have already not been going well with the parent and the teacher because of the child's challenging behaviors. And so the last thing you need is for the consultant to look too in camp with the teacher. And so the consultant will then immediately meet with the parent, find out the story. Remember the story I told you before about the child who was left with dad at two and a half years old? find out the story, and then see how much of the story is this parent willing to share with the school. Because sharing the story may not fix the problem, but it will at least buy you time. And once you have some time, then you have an opportunity to repair the relationship between the teacher and, and the parent. Then the consultant starts coaching the teacher on different ways to interact with the child, largely from things that they've already learned from the parent about what things were working at home and they'll start sharing information in both directions with the consultant then meeting with the parent and the teacher together and then in the beginning playing a very large role in these meetings and then over time slowly pulling herself out of the relationship to leave behind a strong relationship between the parent and the teacher. That's what the mental health consultant is doing during that time. It's, it's, it's brief, it's only three months long based on the Connecticut model, but it's fairly intensive. And the consultant is spending about six, eight, or more hours per week in the classroom with the teachers, and spending about three or four hours in home visits, meeting with the parent, and then meeting with the parent and the teacher together. So is the bill that's coming up here, uh, Senator Green, is it your bill? Yes, it is. Is that to do this? It's to set up a voluntary um, consultation program. <clears throat> okay. So folks who are working with these kids, with kids zero to five, will have resources to call on um, to do exactly what Dr. Gillian was talking about. Okay. And there's no uh, mandate that providers have to do it, um, and there's also no uh, prohibition in it on, expul on expelling kids. I think uh, Connecticut has a, is a little bit more assertive in that regard than this bill is. So. Um, yeah, and it's going to the education Okay. In Connecticut, we started out, um, much like what you're describing, we started out providing the support service, providing the early child mental health consultation. And then we found out that it was literally so successful that we wanted to encourage more people to utilize it. And so the way in which we think of this is we have the mental health consultation to give the teachers the support so that means they don't have to explain them. And then we provided prohibitive language because then once we provided the prohibited language, it drove people towards this thing that we were providing them that we were really successful. Uh, the challenge, I think, is if a state does one without the other, 
uh, you can sometimes fall a little bit short. So if, you, if, if for instance, you provide mental health consultation but no prohibitive language, then it's possible that, that you provide a, a service that people could benefit from, but it will never be as easy to use that service as it is to just tell children to never come back. You know, so some of the times, some of the times that's the challenge that we can run into, but it's a far better challenge than the opposite challenge of if you provide prohibitive language without providing a supportive service. Because once you provide prohibitive language without a supportive service, then programs start to realize, oh, I can't expel any child, so I'm gonna be really careful who I let in in the first place. And they start looking at the children and they start basing assumptions on things that we might not want them basing assumptions on about which child they would later wish they could expel. And then we'll let that child in. You know, so if, if you were to do one without the other, I think the way you're doing it makes a whole lot more sense than to have the prohibitive language legislation without any supports at all. Uh, next slide. I don't know how much time do we have. Probably no time. Oh, I should tell you this. <laughs> statewide random control trial. Statewide random control trial in Connecticut where we randomly assign classrooms to either get the consultation immediately or wait three months. And then we evaluated based on the amount of behavior problems that the children had in the classroom in a three months period of time, significant reduction in challenging behaviors. If you wanna look at the, at, the, um, at the study that we did, we also cost quantified how much it cost per child to be able to provide the services and compared it to any alternative that could be made available, such as outpatient psychotherapy, special ed placement, uh, parent loss of time in, in employment because the child's expelled. This is as cheap as it gets. Uh, this is really a very cheap intervention to take advantage of people who are already mental health providers in a community and then give them the skill sets they need in order to be able to work with preschool teachers who are dying to have anybody who's willing to come to their classroom help. Uh, next slide. I don't know. Now, one of the biggest challenges American schools face right now is the mental it. health needs of students. This morning, we're going to focus on the youngest brains in the system. This is the SCRs. In 2012, some 6,700 uh, children in children in public pre-K around the country were suspended. Experts argue that suspending a three or four year old, no matter how bad the behavior, is a bad idea. New research out this week highlights a powerful alternative to simply sending a child home. Corey Turner of the NPR Ed Team has the story. It's playtime for Miss Terry Walker's preschool class. They're bouncing off the walls of a small YMCA gymnasium in a low-income neighborhood of Bridgeport, Connecticut. While most kids play tag, one boy wearing bright orange socks heads straight for a crate of hay. There, among the balls and cones, he finds a long plastic stick. I'm thinking there must not be enough time for that. Miss Terry, there's not enough time for that. So, if, if anybody wanted to listen to it, you, you go on NPR and you Google by name and Connecticut and expulsion. There's a seven minute bit on there that's highlighting Connecticut's early childhood mental health consultation system. Anytime that we do something in Connecticut or in other states that's going to be beneficial to children and families, we like to make sure that we can get as much national press as possible because it helps galvanize attention to the issue and it helps galvanize uh, interest. So I, I'm sure that I've gone way over my time. If there's any questions that anybody has or anything else that I can do to be helpful, please let me know. Do you have any questions or anything that I can guess? I, I just I, I see a problem in Maine with this with our, our lack of adequate uh, behavioral health uh, yeah. individuals throughout our, our, our rural population. I mean, we don't have because we haven't paid them enough because we haven't attracted them. We just don't have you know. And don't get me wrong; it's it's nothing ill towards the program you suggest. Mm -hmm. It's just. It'd be nice to do. I just don't know if we have the providers, the trained providers, bodies. who can, you know, I mean, in my district or, or in my area, and Walter could attest to this, I mean, we, we have community health and counseling and they keep losing their psychiatrists for a variety of reasons, you know, by, I think, a contributing factor is inadequate wages, uh, really difficult environment. You know, and we as, you know, if you sit, my friends, my friends who sit on the board of these institutions and, and this lady had to leave. Well, she's going to take care of her mother in Virginia, and this person that. All of which is true, but there's a lot of contributing factors, and we just do not attract enough uh, yep. behavioral health staff. I, I, I hear what you're saying. One, we don't need to have child psychiatrists. No, I get that. Uh, I get that. But I mean, you need them trained in, uh, you know, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or what have you. Um, yeah. 
Uh, in, Connecticut, we, in Connecticut, we utilize master's level people. Right. Well, that's in what we Maryland, use, too. In Maryland, they utilize people with bachelor's degrees, even not in mental health. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, we use mental health providers for uh, multi-systemic therapy and the family therapies and what have you. And in fact, the criminal justice uh, pays for usually about a quarter to a third of it because they realize that it's avoiding sending these kids to, was it Long Creek or what have you. Yeah. Um, but we just, you know, we, we need better funding and we need more of these uh, mental health professionals and it need not all be psychiatrists. I, I fully appreciate that. Yeah. I see it as an impediment I, I, I and think, that's not... I think I'm, you bring up a good point. I mean, we just, um, you know, we have it across the board, we have a lot of trouble in Maine right now with direct service of absolutely. any kind. You know, whether it's daily living support for adults with mental illness or intellectual disabilities. Um, and uh, it's been sort of chronically underfunded in the last six or so, 15, 15 years. Um, so, he, you know, that's going to be a challenge that we'll have to tackle. I, and, and, I, and I hear you. I mean, and, and the thing that I would add to that, though, is, is in Maryland, they're using non-credential yeah. to provide this. And, and what they do with them is they provide them sort of like OGT and an awful lot of supervision. So yeah. They provide them lots of on job training on this. They have a curriculum that they sort of like use to train up some people to do this. I don't know exactly what would be the, the most likely workforce to draw upon in Maine, but my, but my guess is what we could do if you were really interested in looking at this is to look at different regions of Maine and urban areas and rural areas and then try to find out are there, are there identifiable groups of people who might be cross-trained into something like this, like school social workers, yeah. like people who work in criminal justice right. um, in other different kinds of capacities such as nurses aides. Could you train nurses aides in different regions? So there might be different types of people who are other than the typical mental health providers that you might also be able to, to, to cross train into this, or even people who have no professional degree at all. And what would be really interesting, I think, for us is to see, now that we know that we can do something like this highly effectively with a professional trained group of providers, can we replicate this in more rural areas without that same workforce? Mm -hmm. And I would, I would personally love to be a part of a project like that. If that's what it makes them. Well, we do. Doesn't Washington County have something like this going yeah. on right now? It, yeah. it also creates a career lattice for the early care and that's education true. people when you want to, when you need a change. Yeah. Which most people and you want to move up, and, and you want to move up or out and do something different for a year or two before you go back to the classroom. And I have seen the model where you're using BA level people, sometimes right. associate level, people. very, very nicely. Very nicely. I've heard of the model to here. I've heard there's at least a couple different groups that are doing some form of early childhood mental health consultation locally. Has anyone done much of an evaluation in terms of exactly how effective those are? Or? I know the, the folks in Washington County have in terms of uh, keeping children in placements yeah. um, and reducing the behavior issues. Again, it's a multi-tiered approach that you're talking about. In Washington County, what's Washington County like? Is it's it? rural, down east, way up north. It's poor, poor. Yeah. drug infested. So it's the areas that you would be the most concerned about whether or not you actually could ramp up something like this. Yes. And that's why. That's why. That's spectacular. Up. Because <laughs> they're doing something. They, they got something good going yeah. on. There are issues of yeah. volume, right. travel, capacity, or which could be responded to. I think. Washington and Hancock County together are almost as big as the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Population. Uh, Only Washington County and parts of it are further away than the state of Connecticut. No. <laughs> so it's the size of Connecticut with the population of India. And that and that reality challenges us, you know, with transportation and with medical care and you know, fill, fill in the blanks, you know. So it's not it's not unique yeah. to this issue. Yeah, yeah. And and the way in which early childhood mental health consultants work anyway is that they're they're largely itinerant. 
Yeah. Right. In most cases, they're not actually located in any particular building. Right. They're moving around anyway. And so in those kind of rural areas, they would have to be in anyway. Yep. But it's a model that lends itself to that. I think some of the things that we've done in Connecticut that makes the model work fairly well is that even though these these people have to go and they and they drive around to different areas, maybe not as big of an area as what we do in Maine, Maine, but they're still you know, driving to different schools and things, they do meet on a regular basis and get group supervision where they talk to somebody who's an expert in this who then hears what they're doing and then allows them to compare notes with other people who are providing the same kind of services. So what I would recommend in an area like, like Maine is that you, you draw heavily upon a model like that. You have a group of people who might be para, more paraprofessional, but then you have at least one or two really well-trained people who really know how to do this. And on a regular basis, like once every week, once every two weeks, these consultants come in and then they share clinical stories from the field and then use that as an opportunity for them to be able to get support from this well-seasoned person and for them to be able to share stories and information among each other to be able to learn more about what things give rise to, to, to better likelihood. And you might be able to, uh, you might be able to rely on distance technology to do some of that too. Well, I mean, it's something we've been playing with. It's okay. We'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you have to pay Canadian rates. <laughs> Is that true? To Some places get yeah. yeah. closer to get more, more likely you're going to. You get picked up by a Canadian. Uh, have to pay the cross federal line. Yeah, you have, to, you have to watch yourself on the well, thank you so much for having me here to talk. I hope some of this was useful. Oh, it'll be great. Can we, Reader, can you and I and Dr. Gillian have a nice little picture together? Yeah. yeah.